This emotional reunion between a lion and the men who raised him has become a YouTube sensation and touched the hearts of millions. It was just an incredible reunion. Whether we were human or he was animal was sort of irrelevant. It has to be the kind of ultimate moment of life with Christian, really. You've only got to see that embrace. You can't describe it in any other way. It's an embrace of love. This extraordinary bond was first formed in 60s London when two friends bought a lion cub. He just adored them. It's the way he looked at them. You can see the love in his eyes. And it endured even after they released him to fight for acceptance in an African pride. We thought he could be killed. It was a chapter in Christian's life that saw his deadly rival become his greatest friend. This is the untold story of Christian, the lion cub from Harrods. London, 1969. The music, fashion and youth culture center of the world. King's Road in the hippest part of London was a magnet for artists and travelers keen to take part in the city's hedonistic lifestyle. It was here that university friends John Rendell and Ace Burke came from Australia to make their mark. Well, it was a well-worn path, in fact. It was like a rite of passage. And Australians headed for London. It was the Mecca. It was where everything was happening. It was the, the exciting, swinging London. It was just a marvellous time to be there. We did know a lot of quite well-known people. The Rolling Stones, you would see them driving up and down the King's Road. This was a fantastic time to be in London. As well as partying with rock stars and actors, the newly arrived Australians took a trip to see Harrods, the world-famous Knightsbridge store that even had its own zoo department. Pier Brazilian tapir, vultures, fruit bats, um, raccoons. People would say that you could get anything from Harrods, from a pin to an elephant. And we did actually get an elephant for somebody at one time. Yes. Um, Hand-reared cubs, of course, because these are so very much tamer. In November 1969, Harrods put two lion cubs on sale. Marta, a lioness, and Marcus, who would be renamed Christian. The cubs came from Ilfracombe Zoo in Devon, the fifth generation of their family to be born in captivity. It was an absolutely astounding moment to, to just look and see these two beautiful creatures for sale. Christian was just full of personality and he was so irresistible and we just kind of looked at each other and said, right, we're going to buy him. In the 60s, keeping exotic animals as pets was popular and perfectly legal. It was not until 1976 that the Endangered Species Act a law of restricting their sale came into force. Harrods interviewed yes. all potential buyers yes, fine. to ensure that the lion cubs went to responsible owners. John asked all the right questions, um, wanted to know what the pitfalls would be and always felt that they would do the best for Christian anyway. Ace and John passed the Harrods test and bought Christian for 250 guineas, the equivalent of over 3,000 pounds today. Neither one had any experience of big cats. The reaction to us buying Christian was probably universally, you've both gone mad and it's quite dangerous and you're stupid and it'll end in tears. It did not seem to be such an absurd idea because London in the 60s was swinging. People were doing all kinds of extraordinary things. Their first problem was where to keep their boisterous new pet. Both worked as salesmen at Sophisticat, a shop selling restored pine furniture in the King's Road, and lived in the flat above. 
They persuaded the owners to let Christian have the run of the shop's large basement. He had a huge kitty litter tray, which he used religiously, like a domestic cat. There was some furniture stored down there that was going to be restored, and so that he could climb on and hide under or creep around and play hide and seek. He was very imaginative. He was very good at making up games. He could stalk around the furniture of Sophisticat and make it look like you were hiding from him. So then he had the freedom to run at you. He loved toys, but he'd shred a teddy bear in two seconds flat. He loved waste paper baskets, and you could chew it, shred it, wear it on your head. Even the cleaner, who came in every day, had her cleaning equipment treated like toys. He thought she was there just as a kind of cabaret, because she had dusters and mops and vacuum cleaners and things. So he would put his paws on the front of the carpet sweeper and we'd play push-pull, and then he'd st steal my dusters and stuff like that. It would be great fun. She wasn't frightened of him at all. I mean, she, not in the slightest. And of course, my children used to go back to school and say, don't mess with us because my, our mom looks after a lion. <laughs> Christian was not restricted to the shop for his entertainment. Ace and John often took him out to visit friends. The girlfriends that we'd left Australia with had a big flat in Queensgate. He knew the flat, so he was just padding around, and he decided to just walk through the flat, walk down and pushed his way into the bathroom, where Robbie was in the bath. And in pads, Christian puts his hands up on the side of the bath and starts drinking the bath water. Well, I'm sort of waving and thinking it's better to be friends. Then I thought, well, if he runs out of water, he might get hungry, so I got particularly nervous. Anyway, with a lot of screaming and everything, um, John eventually came and got him out of the bathroom, but I was pretty scared. <laughs> As Christian grew bigger, so did the challenges of raising an African lion in a city. At six months old, he was already devouring three kilos of meat a day. Lions, certainly in the wild, are large animals. An adult male lion can grow to about 250 kilograms. And in order to maintain uh, a body of that size, you do need to eat um, uh, lots and you do need to eat fairly regularly. They'll bring down something like a, a wildebeest and the pride will feed on that and they will really stuff themselves. They eat until you see hugely extended stomachs. Wildebeest wasn't an option in Chelsea, but friends and admirers rallied round to help satisfy Christian's growing appetite. There was a chef from a nearby restaurant who bought him fabulous meat that we had rather had our eye on, very nice steaks that just hadn't been used that day, and very big bones. It was an expense to keep him, so we thought, you know, what can we do? So we met a photographer called Derek Katani, who was a friend of a friend, and he came along and started a record of Christian's life in London. And so I said, well, let's get together uh, a couple of feature ideas. And I said, uh, well, Easter's coming up now. Uh, let's think about something to do with Easter and Easter chicks. It was an amazing situation because we thought that a great big paw was going to come down on this, this poor little chick, you know, and that was the end of the day old chick, but none of it. He was so gentle. I think we got 30 pounds for the photograph, which was very good. And they decided he had to have a bank account, so we took him up to our bank and our bank manager opened an account for him so he could put his money in. Paying Christian's meat bill wasn't the only challenge. A growing lion needs serious exercise. But Ace and John knew that letting him loose in the leafy parks of Chelsea could cause a riot. At the end of King's Road, they discovered a walled cemetery attached to the Moravian church. It would make the perfect exercise enclosure for Christian. Ace and John managed to persuade Reverend Williamson, the church minister, to let them exercise Christian in his cemetery. My father had a wicked sense of humour of having a, a lion exercising over graveyards of Christians. Uh, on the other hand, he was also a great naturalist and he would have recognised a real need to let the lion have some freedom rather than being cooped up in a shop or a house. Ace 
Ace and John didn't know it, but Christian wasn't just being playful. He was developing the skills a lion needs to survive in the wild. A lot of the play that young cubs will do with one another when they will um, practice stalking and jumping on one another and, and play fighting is all part of learning how to hunt. But there is a learnt aspect and that learnt aspect is often reinforced by play. Christian's lion instincts were surfacing. But after four months being raised by Ace and John, he had clearly formed a strong bond with them. He was dependent on us, but he loved us back as well. We were the closest things to him. But Christian had such a personality that he was sort of another person in their lives, wasn't he? He would always leap in, put yes. his arms around them. They would put their arms around him. <laughs> He was affectionate with us. He would jump up on us or sit on us or he wanted to be close to us or like a good cat. If you were reading a newspaper on the telephone, he'd want to sit on you. It was just like having a child and it was like John and Ace were his parents, you know. He just adored them. It's where he looked at them. You can see the love in his eyes. Christian was now eight months old and weighed 70 kilos. Ace and John realized that his size was becoming a problem. Christian really was getting too big and very quickly was really too big to bundle up if we were worried about a situation just to hold him in our arms and we were worried what would happen next. As he grew bigger, he was really capable of inflicting real damage. Once, I think I'd been out for the evening and I called him, you know, like we used to stand at the top of the stairs and call him, and he ran up, to, up the stairs to put his hands on my shoulders like he does, and he slipped on the top step and put his claws out and ripped my whole dress off the front of me. <laughs> my Bieber dress, my best to be dressed. But he didn't hurt me. I mean, I didn't have a claw mark or anything. It's just the whole dress went off. Another incident brought home to Ace and John that Christian was a predator, hardwired for aggression. One day he found a fur belt had dropped off some customer's coat in the shop and he picked it up and I went to pull it away from him. And for the first time, he flattened his ears and snarled in a very, very nasty way, frightening me and both of us, John came then, and, but signalling very clearly, I'm having this, don't try and take it away from me. Christian's rapid growth was also putting his exercise regime in peril. Towards the end, as Christian got larger, it was becoming a little difficult because of the visitors in, in the churchyard. And I think my father felt a little bit uncomfortable the larger the lion got, how long this could continue for, and suggested that uh, it might have to stop. So we knew that the time was coming where we had to accept that London was no longer going to be his home. Christian needed a new home. But the options were unappealing. Ace and John rejected circuses and zoos. They didn't want him living in captivity like his parents. We'd just become so fond of him, you know, we just knew that we couldn't betray him by putting him in a zoo. We, we just couldn't do that for Christian. We thought we've got to find something. What was it going to be? We didn't know. Ace and John were getting desperate, but then an extraordinary chance encounter changed everything. Film stars Bill Travers and Virginia McKenna visited the King's Road furniture shop and came face to face with Christian. Ace and John seized the moment. When they met us, I think they thought, what about, is there a chance here? Because they said to Bill, do you think you could help us to get Christian, you know, a, a better future. And he said, would you agree to let Christian go back to the wild? Dry 
Adamson's well-known story of life with the lions has now been brought to the screen. It was chosen for the role Travers of and McKenna had starred in the 60s box office hit Born Free four years earlier. It told the true story of an orphaned lion cub, Elsa, who was successfully reintroduced into the wild. It had turned them into passionate lion conservationists, and they were still in touch with the man whose work had inspired the film. George Adamson was a lion expert who hand-reared orphan cubs like Elsa, preparing them for life in the wild. It was controversial work. Some experts said that the lion's familiarity with humans in the camp could never be risk-free. But for John and Ace, Adamson represented Christian's best chance for freedom. So they contacted George Adamson and he then said, what an exciting challenge to be able to try, he did stress try, and rehabilitate a fifth generation um, zoo bred lion. Because Elsa was born in Africa, Elsa knew the smells of Africa, Elsa knew what a water buck looked like, Christian didn't. It was the perfect solution, we were just thrilled. Anything to avoid a safer, longer life in confinement, in cages, so we didn't hesitate for a moment. But there was a major stumbling block. They needed permission from the Kenyan government to import Christian. Negotiations would be complex and lengthy. There was a huge amount of red tape and, of course, some um, reaction in Kenya from why would we want to bring basically another predator into our country? We've got enough lions already. The rapidly growing Christian needed somewhere bigger to live and fast. <laughs> Virginia and Bill offered a lifeline. Christian could stay at their country home in Dorking, Surrey, until the Kenyans gave a verdict. It was marvelous when we first got there. You know, he jumped out and then just didn't take off, but just him walking without us guiding him, trying to lead him or control him. Scared by the scarecrow in their garden, and again, he didn't run off, he just would go ahead and investigate and then come back to us for reassurance. Virginia and Bill built Christian a huge, secure compound in their garden. It was the closest he had ever been to the wild. Christian, he was obviously delighted when he moved to the country. You know, it was a different environment and uh, he loved his space there. Ace and John gave up their jobs and moved into a caravan beside the compound. They knew these would be the last weeks they would have with Christian, and they wanted to make the most of every second. When we were in the country, it never for a moment crossed our minds that we would leave him there without us being with him. Christian was our responsibility. We didn't want him to feel abandoned. That was part of our deal with him. It was such a pleasure to have more time with him. And yes, one did grow even closer to him and get to know him even better. They were always trying to think of ways to keep him interested. That was just stimulating, you know, so he didn't get fed up and bored. We took him uh, very early one morning to go to West Wittering and run on the beach with balloons. When he dipped his paw in the sea and hated it, you see, oh gosh, I don't like this, he went off. So we were all, I think I remember my husband was rushing along waving a balloon in the air or something because we brought all these balloons down to play with. But um, Christian didn't want to, he just wanted to race. He just raced on the beach and we all puffed and blew after him, you know, and then we all flopped into the sand. Four weeks after Christian's move to Dorking, there was still no word from the Kenyan government. And the delay meant that the 10-month-old Christian was outgrowing his compound. 
He occasionally tried to climb the wire, so we did in fact build like an overhang to just ensure he wouldn't get out. The situation would only get worse as Christian grew bigger. George Adamson, the legendary wildlife conservationist, had offered Christian a place at his reserve in Kenya. But Ace and John were starting to worry that the Kenyans were going to refuse to let Christian into their country. We did get scared that it could all fall through, so we got quite worried. Ace and John's dream of returning Christian to the wild was in serious doubt. And with no fallback plan, Christian's entire future hung in the balance. After three months of negotiations, the Kenyan government finally gave their permission for Christian to enter the country. The young lion was on his way to Africa. We get him out to Heathrow. We gave him a very mild sedative, which was recommended by various vets and the London Zoo. I remember we stood there and we saw him and then they put something in the front so that he couldn't see anymore. And then he was lifted on the hoist up into the hold and it was quite heart-stopping, actually. That was scary, seeing him loaded into the hold at Heathrow and we weren't really sure if he'd survive the journey. The journey from London to Nairobi in 1970 was mammoth. It was 15 hours before Bill Travers, Ace and John arrived in Africa and were reunited with Christian. It was just a huge relief to see him at the other end. Christian had made it to Africa, but whether he could survive in the wild would be down to one man. George Adamson. He was smaller than we imagined and quite dapper, in quite a crisp sort of safari suit. This unassuming gentleman was a revered, if controversial, figure in Kenya, where his practice of training domesticated lions to return to the wild was seen by some as risky to humans. George was taking Christian to Cora Nature Reserve, in a deserted part of the country. There, he hoped to establish a new lion pride with Christian at its heart. We were driving up, Christian was in the back, and I knew he wanted to go to the loo. So I said, look, Mr. Adamson, please, we've got to stop. And George said, look, we're in the middle of nowhere. If he runs off, he said, we'll never catch him. We in very, very confidently said, no, he won't run off. Christian got out, went to the loo, and I said, OK, come on, back you get. So he just jumped straight back into the Land Rover. And in fact, George was very impressed. George said, well, that's quite remarkable. I think he's going to be fine, and you can call me George. So I turned around to Christian and said, yes, yes, you're going to be all right. <laughs> After travelling over 200 kilometres, Ace, John and Christian arrived at Cora Nature Reserve. Christian's new home in the bush. It must have been extraordinary for Christian to suddenly find himself in such a totally alien environment. He might have been in a new continent, but Christian still demanded his home comforts. The first night in Africa was a bit embarrassing, really. Ace had a bunk here and I had a, a, a stretcher here and a stretcher there, and Christian was um, there. Well, of course, he slept on one of the beds with a pillow. With beds, pillows, Ace, John, and photographer Derek there with him, Christian must have felt Africa was just home from home. He seemed unfazed by his new environment. Watching Christian's reaction to crocodiles and hippo popping their heads out of the water. He didn't want to uh, uh, be aggressive towards them. He just thought that they were uh, part of the landscape. The relaxed demeanor of Ace, John, and Christian masked the reality. Christian was a London lion in Africa, and his background put him at great risk. There are clear challenges in releasing a lion to the wild. It's not simply the matter of opening the back of a lorry door and letting it run free, because if you do that, it would be very likely to encounter other lions, behave inappropriately, and risk death. 
George Adamson's plan was to create a pride with Christian and two other lions. Catania, an orphaned lioness cub, and Boy, an adult male, born and domesticated in Africa. But first, they had to bond. A totally new experience for Christian. He thought he was the only lion in the world. And it was a shock to meet one that was three times his size. The first time he saw Boy, you can imagine, you know, he's never seen, he hasn't seen a mature lion since his father. And there's this enormous and very cross lion too. For Boy, Christian was a threat. In prides, younger lions often attempt to usurp an older lion's position. His first reaction when he saw Christian was very aggressive and frightening. He would keep charging at the wire to, you know, to, to really scare Christian. And he was scared, and we were scared too, I can tell you. Boy was probably about 400 pounds, comes hurtling at the, at the wire fence, it was only chicken wire. It's quite um, something. Christian was scared and got in behind our legs and sort of snarled unhappily. It was quite scary. Christian could not hide behind John and Ace forever. If George's pride was going to work, Christian and Boy would need to face each other outside the compound to establish the hierarchy. One day, George said, we just have to bite the bullet. We just have to do it. And George and Ace and John and Christian walked up this rock to where Boy was sitting. Boy rose, and he seemed to double in size, and his mane sort of swelled. He looked truly, truly frightened. This was a moment of life or death. Would Boy accept Christian? It's really terrifying to see this huge, fully grown lion coming down and just belting Christian. In the quickness of the movements, we thought he could be killed. But amazingly, Christian's lion instinct kicked in. Christian snarled but rolled onto his back in the correct submission to an adult lion. Christian stood it, he didn't run away, and he obviously knew that this was part of being a lion was. Battling for position within the pride is normal lion behavior. Christian wasn't injured by Boy's attack, but he had been put in his place. Boy had established he was the boss, he was the father of the pride, as it were, and Christian knew his place, and they became absolutely closest, closest of, of friends. George Adamson was pleased. His first core of pride was finally taking shape. But now there was no longer a role for Ace and John. We could see it was starting to work, and we had to step back, and the relationship that we had with Christian, we had to pass on to George. It was sad to leave him, but there was a moment of thinking, you know, there you are, you've, you, you're, you're in the right place, the right man, and you've really got a chance. The fact that we'd got him there, and he would probably have a future there, it made our feelings not irrelevant, but that was such a good feeling. <laughs> Ace and John's life has centered on Christian for over a year. Now, after four weeks with him in Kenya, it was time to leave Christian with his new family, his lion pride. He did um, pad down the track as we left, um, and that was sad. Returning to London was difficult for John and Ace, but George Adamson sent them regular bulletins on Christian's progress. I still got all his letters that, um, you know, he would bring us up, he'd type them away on his you know, little old Remington, whatever it was. It was always, you know, the, the, the good news of how, how he and Boy were getting along, so it really kept us up to date with what was, what was happening. 
The news from Cora in the two months since they left was that Boy and Christian had become inseparable. They had changed from enemies to friends and would disappear away from the compound for days at a time. An African lion teaching the European youngster the ways of the wild. But Cora was not just home to Boy and Christian. It was also home to rival lions, and this made life fraught with danger. Boy and Christian being males were always going to have trouble with the wild lions. They were never going to just let them carve their own territory out in their territory. In the eight months since John and Ace left, Christian's pride had been trying to establish their territory. But then, a major setback. A vicious clash with the rival lions left Boy seriously injured. Despite George's care, the debilitating attack had far-reaching results. Boy's temperament changed, and he became a real threat to humans. On the 6th of June, 1971, Boy returned to the compound, where George and his staff, including his assistant Stanley, lived. Outside the compound, Stanley was attacked by Boy. The first thing that was heard was this shrieking and roaring and shrieking from a person and roaring from an animal. George grabbed his gun and saw Stanley in Boy's mouth. And George had no alternative but to shoot Boy. And Stanley actually died too from his wounds. He never recovered. So it was a double and terrible tragedy. It was just devastating news. It became international news about George Adamson's tame lions the danger of his work rather than the good aspects of his work. The death of Stanley was a tragedy, a loss to his family and to George. With Boy's death, Christian had lost his best friend. He would sit by Boy's grave for hours on end. Now the only male in the Cora Pride, he was on his own. Tony Fitzjohn, a 25-year-old with a love of wildlife, joined George Adamson at Cora. He recognised Christian's unhappiness. He did miss Boy. It, it did add to his fear level. Boy wasn't there anymore. It was sort of, how do I cope now? What do I do? You know, why is he gone? Where's he gone? And there, there's always that period of worry and uncertainty, non-understanding of why someone suddenly disappeared. But they get themselves together pretty quickly and have to, you know, sort of create their own lives. Boy's death and Christian's loneliness worried John and Ace. After a year apart from him, they decided it was time to return to Africa. Like family, they wanted to give Christian support. They knew that things would be different this time. We weren't sure of our reception this time. We always thought anything could happen. It was very dangerous. It was the wilds of Africa. After an anxious day in the compound, Ace and John walked onto Christian's territory. George might be welcome here, but Ace and John were almost strangers. They hadn't seen Christian in a year. If he puts them as unwelcome guests, there could be trouble. George appeared on the top of the hill, I suppose about a hundred meters away from us, with Christian. Christian ambled down another 10 or 15 meters and had a very long, hard look at us. You could just see him assessing what was going on. He kept walking slowly, slowly down towards us. And I think that was the 
point where we actually couldn't bear it any longer and actually called out his name. And at that moment, the pace picks up. just so, so excited. And of course we were. I mean, imagine how excited we were. It was just an incredible reunion. Whether we were human or he was animal was sort of irrelevant. Christian's acceptance of John and Ace was mirrored by the lionesses brought to Cora three months earlier to develop the pride. They too welcomed the newcomers. Suddenly, we were aware that those two lionesses were with us as well and they were greeting us and pushing and shoving. We had these lions we didn't know milling around us Christian jumping up on us, George beaming. It was really quite sort of euphoric. It's actually quite hard to find the words for it. Everyone, lions, humans, all felt we'd shared something very, very special. So it was very emotional for all of us. And we knew we'd been part of or witnessed something quite extraordinary. Christian's London family relaxed with his African family, the lionesses and an orphan cub. Ace and John were confident that Christian had found his place in Africa. To leave him the second time was easier, really, because you knew it was he was such a success. He had a wonderful relationship with George. He obviously had a powerful relationship with the lionesses. And he was huge. Ace and John went back to London, reassured about Christian's future as an African lion. But a growing lion reaching maturity could be a serious threat to those around him. George told us later, adolescence was the most dangerous time for lions. That's when he was most wary of them. Christian, at around this time, had, in fact, knocked Tony to the ground. He flattened me, put my head in his mouth, rolled over on his back and proceeded to kick me with his back legs. And then he thought that was a lot of fun, so then he shook me a bit and then he dropped me. And I was getting quite scared. He was this huge, great guy just playing with me like a rag doll. And so he came straight for me, so I punched him straight in the nose. And it worked, and he veered off. It must have been like a tap to him, you know, because they're so tough. Christian came up a few minutes later, mm, mm, like, you know, saying hello and being friendly, and, you know, and I refused to talk to him for the rest of the day. <laughs> he never did it again, but every now and then I get the look. And I'm saying, you do that again, you said. And he goes, ooh, not me, you know, and, and it, was, it was great. Ace and John had wanted Christian to grow up in Africa to find his place in the wild. They continued to seek out information about his life on the other side of the world. George had been keeping us up to date with what was happening and that he'd been disappearing for months on end and was obviously looking to establish his own territory further away from Cora. About a year later, we thought it would be nice to go again just to see how he was getting on. In June 1972, John and Ace made the 5,000 kilometer journey back to Kenya, hoping to see their three-year-old lion again. George warned us that he mightn't even come to camp. We still thought it was worthwhile going, just in case we did see him. Mm. 
After three days of waiting, Christian finally arrived at the compound. Of course, he did turn up again. And this time, he was very different from the year before. He had matured considerably. He was much, much bigger. He was much more, I'm, you know, I'm grown up now. He was so incredibly handsome, incredibly lovely. All lions loved him, all humans loved him. He was extraordinary. He lost none of his charisma. He'd be sitting with us and then suddenly he'd get up and he'd just walk away and sit somewhere else. We were undoubtedly more superfluous to his life. It was like, now I've got lion things to do. Christian might be a proud adult lion, but he hadn't forgotten all of his playful London ways. The very last night we had with Christian really was enormous fun. Everyone was so relaxed and laughing and, and uh, you know, he was just happy to be around him. We were all smoking cigarettes in those days and, uh, and drinking, so of course we all were up all night laughing and joking and Christian being silly. Sitting on us, on the table, totally disrupting us. And the next day he goes back up to the lionesses. Christian, of course, being up all night was kind of obviously you know, he had a, a night out with the boys kind of just turned around and went, oh, wallop, and just collapsed, you know, just, just oh, that's it, girls, you know, I've had it. We went up to see him that night, and, and he'd gone. You think you will be back, you will hear news, it'll be a continuing story, and in fact, it was the last time. He'd gone. He wasn't going to come back. John and Ace never saw Christian again. He was no longer dependent on any of us. And that was the, the most wonderful success. He'd done it. We just hoped that he'd found his own territory, had his own cubs, had his own pride, and had a marvellous, normal, natural life. Christian, the lion cub from Harrods, was given the chance to live the life of an African lion. He might have gone on to survive another 10 years in the wild. John and Ace are convinced that they did the right thing, giving him back his freedom. They've now updated their book, A Lion Called Christian, that tells his inspirational story. But it was the first internet posting of their reunion clip by a Californian student in 2006 that turned their story into a global phenomenon. Hi. Hello. I'm John. I just really believe that video needed to be seen. I was surprised it wasn't anywhere else on YouTube or on the internet anywhere else. I couldn't find anything. Joy, really. To date, the reunion has had almost 50 million hits. Why do you think? Um, it has been so popular on YouTube. Well, I think it's striking people on a very powerful basis of love. I'm really glad that the internet's out there and is raising awareness, and I'm glad to have been a part of it. It's like a gift to the world, really. That's how we see it. Special hug. Thank you. It is quite mind-boggling. 50 million people have watched the reunion video, and we do wonder how can we harness that incredible goodwill and interest? So I do think it's all meant to be. I think possibly it's a cry for Africa from Kristen from 40 years ago. If he can raise awareness of conservation and the need to protect endangered species, what a fantastic legacy he's left. Thank you, Christian.